Thank you, Robin. As many of you know, I load an outline of my sermon each week on uh, what's called Uversion. You can find it on that app on most smartphones. Last night I was having difficulty doing it, and some of you have already asked about it, and I think it's okay now. Um, I didn't realize it, but I put in the wrong time zone about six hours away. I was thinking of Tahiti and the time zone there, I suppose. But anyway, I think, I think it's available to you. But before we get there, I want to just, because we have a few extra minutes because of Kids Fest, and we have a little bit more abbreviated service, but uh, I want to tell you a few of the things that are, that are happening around here. You know, in just a few weeks from now, I believe it's March 12, we're going to begin 40 days of prayer. Um, you know, from the first few weeks that Shirley and I arrived here in Baltimore first and meeting with our leadership team, we knew that where we wanted to go and what we wanted to see happen here wasn't going to happen by human effort. We knew as leaders the only way anything significant was going to happen is as we pray and as we ask God to do what he wants to do. The good news is God's already told us what he's interested in and what he's passionate about. He's passionate about you and everyone like you and everyone that isn't like you. He's passionate about people. And, and so while we're excited about what's happening in the church and different things about this, God is concerned with people. And we as a church, we want to be concerned with people as well. I've learned you can get really busy in church doing a lot of things. And if you're not careful, you're not making an impact on people's lives. And at the end of the day, when everything is stripped away, that's what matters most. We want to be fully devoted disciples of Jesus. Not just church attenders. Not just fill the place up on, on Saturday to have a crowd. But we want to grow. We want to grow spiritually. You see, we live in a world that that's not just a natural thing that happens. In fact, if it happens, it's supernatural. Because the natural thing that normally would happen in a world in which we live is to make us more worldly. We don't have to work hard at doing that. If we don't do anything, that's what's going to happen. But God calls us to grow as disciples of, of His. And we want to be about that. And so we set out to begin to pray and pray and pray. And you know, God, God has shown us that He honors that faith. You know, prayer... Prayer is an act of faith. You know that, right? Because in order to pray, you have to believe that God exists. And then further, you have to believe that God will do something as a result of that. And I'm not just talking about our prayers tell God what to do. When I say do something, what he's more inclined to do and what he does most and what he does best is to change us. To change the prayers. And so we, we've seen how God has worked, and God has done amazing things. And so as we begin 2016 and our, our, our missionary work that we want to do, our evangelistic efforts throughout this year, I want to invite you. I want to invite you to become a prayer warrior, to realize that what we are doing is we are fighting a supernatural battle. The enemy of our souls does not let us go easy. And so we need to pray that those powers, those unseen powers, those principalities and powers that God reminds us are on our side will work for us, that will go before us and will bless us. And so we're going to do 40 days leading up to our next evangelistic meeting that will start near the latter end of April. Something else that has happened, and I believe that it's in a sense a providence of God. Since I arrived you know, been kind of looking over the facility, trying to figure out how best to use the resources that God has given to us. And one of the things that I noticed is we were really full and, and tight, and we didn't have a lot of extra space. And as God has led us through this past year or so, one of the things that has happened is a room has become available and we, we thought we were making this room available for one purpose, for our Korean a sister church. The pastor wanted an office, and so we felt that was important so that he could minister to people and, and have a place, because by the time they get here at three o'clock in the afternoon, this place is packed. 
There is not an inch that is not being used in this building, and, and there was nowhere for him to go, and so we decided that we would, we would do that, that we would create an office. Well, as it turned out, he passed, and so we had this space. And again, one of the things that I've always wanted to do is to have a prayer room, a place. I know the whole church is set aside and, and in a sense, dedicated to God, but to have a special place where you can go and to just, in a, in a sense, nothing else is going to happen in there. It's not a place to congregate. It's not a place to, to just visit and, or to sleep, gentlemen, you know, because there's some fur, nice furniture in there. But it's a place where we can go and we can pray. We've got, we've got some prayer boards up there, and we're sharing. The first things that are on those prayer boards are our initiatives for this year. We're praying for God to give us 40 souls throughout this next year, that we could lead 40 people from darkness to light. Wouldn't that be a powerful thing? Oh, I, I can't think of, you know, and I don't want to limit God, you know, because he says he can do abundantly more than we could ask or think. So we're going to ask and we're going to think, and if God wants to do more, then I'm all for it. I'm all in for that. But it's down the hallway, right across from the pastor's office, you'll see a room. And it's not 100% done, but it's there. As you walk in, there's, there's, uh, we're trying to figure out the best way to do that, but we created a, a little placard, prayer room etiquette, to kind of govern the space so it's comfortable for everyone. And uh, I hope that you will know that any time our doors are open, those doors will be open. And uh, there, are, there are boards there that you can write your prayer requests. You can also write answers to prayer. But I, I foresee a time um, when that place will always have someone there praying anytime our doors are open. And I just, I know God's going to do great things. So I, I want to praise him this morning for how God works. You know, the Bible says that this is not a house of worship. It's not a house of fellowship. He says, my house shall be a house of prayer for all people. I was reading a book not long ago. It's prayed on or prayed for, P-R-E-Y. And uh, it, it, it really convicted me as a pastor. And it said, how much time does your church family, when you're together, spend praying? If this is a house of prayer, or could by what you do, and by what happens on a Sabbath morning, should it be relabeled a house of announcements or a house of visiting or a house of fellowship? And those things are all good. I, I don't have any issues with that. But we need, we need to, to be a people of prayer. And I want to encourage you to do that. You see, I, I, I'm very old school. I, I believe at the heart of the Christian experience are the spiritual disciplines. People come to me all the time, Pastor, how do I grow as a Christian? You know, how can, I, how can I be on fire for God? How can I do this? How can I do that? And you know what? There are no new answers. It's not about something new and tantalizing and exciting. The way you grow as a Christian is you commit yourself to spiritual disciplines. That's what it means to be a disciple. We don't like that word. You know, most of us are hoping that we become that we grow in the Lord just somehow when God zaps us and we don't put any effort. You know, righteousness by dreaming. You know, we go to sleep one day and we wake up better the next. It's not about that. It's in direct, it's in direct response to what we do. The spiritual principle of sowing and reaping is very much involved in, in the life of a disciple. And if you want to be close to the Lord, if you want God's power and presence in your life, if you want to walk with God as no other person that you've ever known, to go that deep with God, you know what? You can do that. It's not arbitrary. God is willing. The real issue is, are we willing? Are we willing to do that? Are we willing to walk with God in that way? I I, that's my hope in our, in our prayer, that we will be known as a church that is walking with God. One of my favorite books is a book by the name of Practice of the Presence of God. It's an old book, been around a long time. If you look at the author, it, it's, it's, it's penned by Brother Lawrence. His name was actually Nicholas Herman. He lived back in the 17th century, lived a good part of his life until he decided to become a monk. 
He wanted, he wanted to live for God. He wanted to dedicate himself to God, to know God, not to serve God. You know, it's, a lot of us have this idea about doing something great for God. We want to accomplish something. We want to be able to do something, go somewhere or whatever else. His heart, he just wanted to know God. And you know, we, we can't miss that because there is power in knowing God. In the middle of his life, he became a monk, and, and I guess because he started out late in life, he was kind of low on the monk scale, you know, and he ended up in the kitchen. And while all the other monks prayed for hours upon end, he cooked. He prepared the meals. And, and he lived his whole life without really ever any, any acknowledgement or any, uh, any notice. And then when he died, there were some people that, that apparently had, had the opportunity to get to know him, and he was known, he, he was well known from, for, for this concept of living in the presence of God. And as they went through his room, they found some documents, they found some journals, they found some letters that he had written, and they put them all together and put them in that book. And, and you know, again, this book's been around a while. It was, it was John Wesley that read it, and he said, you know, literally it was one of his favorite books about this idea of a spiritual discipline of living in the presence of God. Now that might sound easy. Living in the presence of God, how, you know, how hard is that? But friends, I want you to know, like every other spiritual discipline, it's easy and it's hard at the same time. You know what I mean? Let me give you an example. Prayer is a spiritual discipline, right? Is prayer easy? You better believe it. Prayer is easy. A child can do it without much direction and without much education. But if you commit yourself to be a man or a woman of prayer, you know how hard that is. You know how hard that is. And you know what kind of a sacrifice that takes. You see, that's the way we are. We want a little bit of God. So we do a little bit of prayer and a little bit of Bible study and a little bit of worship and a little bit of being alone with God. But for those that are really committed to know God and to know his heart and to get close to him, it is a challenge. So it is this discipline that we talk about, about being in God's presence is easy. You know why it's easy? Jesus made it easy. You know, Jesus made it easy. What is it that the, the prophet Isaiah said about the coming of the Messiah that we think about at Christmas? And Matthew picks up on it, talks about the birth of the Messiah, and he shall be called Emmanuel. And you know what does that mean? God is with us. Jesus forever makes it easy for man to be near God because not only does he open the way to God, he is the way to God. He says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. So Jesus makes it easy for us. As a follower of God, I want you to know, God has an open door policy in your life. That God's always open. You know, there's, there's, I've, lived in, uh, I've lived and worked in various environments, and I can tell you, in some organizations, the higher you go, the harder it is to get in and to see someone and to go in and see the CEO or go in and see someone. But, but God has this, this policy among believers that if you've been born again, if you are part of his family, this door is always open to family. What is Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 16? What is that scripture says? One that we, we talk about so much. Let us therefore because you talk about what came before that, and it talks about that through Christ, the way has been opened. He says, therefore, come boldly to the throne of grace. I, I've never understood why people are so hesitant to pray about things, why people are so hesitant to approach God or talk to God or, or whatever else, because the Bible tells us we're family. We're his children. That God is not distant, but God is anxious for us. To be with him. So I want, today I want to talk to you about developing this habit of practicing the presence of God. And it's going to start with this, a little nuance of words, because if we're not careful, we'll, meet you, we'll, we'll miss it. But a crucial distinction must be made. 
practicing the presence of God all day long means that we have to acknowledge God's presence all day long. Now that might seem like just a play on words, but it's not. It's transformative when you think about it. Because don't we know that, well, God is everywhere? That God is always there? But as I said in our opening, sometimes as we're not careful, we'll live like God doesn't exist. So not long ago, in another church, I, I wanted to do a series on the names of God. What a powerful Bible study that is. You know, God has a lot of names. A lot of names. I mean, just a lot of names. But, but in the Old Testament, he is usually identified as Jehovah or Yahweh. But that's not enough. It's not enough because our God is so big that, that it's almost like one doesn't complete him. And so often there's another word that's connected with that. And some of you are probably thinking, if I said Jehovah Jireh, what does that mean? God provides. That God makes a way. So putting these things together, and, and so I was going through this study, and I was, I was learning about, the, you know, these names, Jehovah Jireh, and then Jehovah Shalom. God is our peace. You see, that's even in the Old Testament. God is our peace. And then I came across one I didn't know very well. It was Jehovah Shammah. You know what that means? The Lord is present. The Lord is present. As I was thinking about that and pondering it and praying over it, I had one of those aha moments. You know what I'm talking about? You know, when, when it just jumps out at you, it grabs a hold of you, and it won't let you go. I, I hope you have those, it, you know, in the Word of God. If you don't, you're really missing out on it. And, 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 you know, those are only special often to us. You know, some of you Sabbath school teachers know exactly what I'm talking about. You study the lesson, and, and you see something that you've never seen before. And I mean, all week long, you know, your mind is saturated with it. And you come to Sabbath school class, and there's 15 people that look like they're zombies. <laughs> And you share this, this revelation. I mean, that's what it is. It's a revelation that the Holy Spirit has given to you. And they go, yeah, that's nice. <laughs> it's frustrating. It really is. But anyway, I, I, I kind of had one of those aha moments. I realized that this name, Jehovah Shema, the Lord is present. You know what that means? If you break it down and you dig deep, and you really try to come up with what is the meaning of that, here's what it is. Jeho Je Jehovah Shema, the Lord is present. Here's what it means. God is present. Okay, not an aha moment, a duh moment. A duh moment, but sometimes you need those. That God is present. Not only that, but the, the context and in, in, in the form of it, it's he's present now. He's present in the past, and he'll be present in the future. It's this ongoing thing that God is present. Wow. I love that. That's a powerful statement. You see, when, when I, when I want to talk with God, when I want to pray to God, it's not that the prayers have to go out of my mouth, through the ceiling tiles, through the insulation, through the roof, through the atmosphere, to the floor of heaven, and then get through heaven, and then he hears them. That's not. That's not our God. It, our, our prayer doesn't have to travel, nor do we have to travel to be in the presence of our God. The reason I think that was meaningful to me was because at the time, I was feeling pretty much alone. And forgotten. I was feeling neglected. I was feeling kind of, well, that my prayers weren't really being effectual, and I was a little discouraged, and I felt, I felt that God wasn't as close to me as I have sensed him in the past. And then for God to reveal 
that he is the Jehovah Shema, that I am the God that is present, and I am there. And then it, then it dawned on me, it doesn't do any good for me that if God is present, if I don't acknowledge it, it doesn't do me any good. I mean, I won't say any good. It doesn't do me as much good because the presence of God provides protection and he's at work in my life in ways I don't know and I benefit from that. I've seen that. You know, there are people that live their whole life, never acknowledge God, but God's been at work in their life, especially for those of us that have given our heart to the Lord and we look back and we go, wow, look what God did. Look how God preserved me and how God protected me, even though I never even, I, in fact, like an idiot, I thought he didn't exist. And there he was doing all of that on my behalf. So it's not that it doesn't do any good, but to acknowledge his presence. We're talking about living in the presence of God. That is a fact. But I don't want us just to to accept the theological truth that we live in the presence of God, but that we are aware constantly of the presence of God. That's a game changer. The Lord is present. That's what it says. That means God is with me. God is with me when I'm working in my office. God is with me when I'm spending time with my family. God is with me when I'm on the highway. God is with me when I'm in my home. God is with me at the supermarket. God is with me in the hospital. God is with me when I'm sick. God is with me when I am celebrating. God is with me when I'm feeling lonely. And God is with me when I'm broke. Pretty much covers about everything. God is with me. God is with you too. I have learned the real meaning of Psalms 23. And I believe it's verse 4. You know, David is talking about this idea of, that's 34.4. I'm looking at Psalms 23, verse 4. I may not have put that one in. Here's what it says. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, Why? You know, there are times when our human senses don't feel the presence of God. I know what that's like. I've lived that way. But just because you feel as if he isn't there doesn't mean that he isn't. That's part of what it means to live by faith. We live by the word of God. And God says he's with us always. He is Jehovah Shammah. And so he is always with us. Living in the presence of God begins with acknowledging his presence day by day. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to begin to practice this. When you wake up in the morning, if you wake up next to somebody that you're supposed to anyway, that lives with you, before you say hello to them, good morning, Lord. That'll forever change the course of your day. Good morning, Lord. Good morning. Why? He's there. He's there. You don't even have to go brush your teeth first. He is there. Why? Because he was there when you went to sleep. He was there when you went to sleep, and he's there, you know, almost like, I can't wait for him to wake up. I can't wait for so-and-so to get up so we can be together. So he'll know I'm here. She'll know I'm here. It begins with acknowledging the presence. I grew up in a, in a family of four children, three other siblings, two older, one younger. So I'm one of those middle children. Probably explains a lot of the trouble I'm having in life. But that said, you know, there's always dynamics that are at play with big families. You know how it is. I mean, you, you, you just have to tolerate each other. I had an older sister that uh, I love dearly, and I've grown to love her a lot more as we've gotten older and we don't live together. But when we were living together, she had this quirk about her that if she got angry, you know, she wouldn't argue. You know, some of my family, we'll go toe-to-toe. We'll just scream at one another and, until, you know, somebody gives in or somebody goes hoarse. But, but, but she wasn't that way. When she got mad at you, she had this habit of just ignoring you. And it was really quite comical. 
Here we are living in kind of a small house and we're all there. And if she was mad at you, she would walk right by you, invading your comfort zone just to mm, you and, and not even acknowledge. She wouldn't, she wouldn't look at you. If, you know, she wouldn't talk to you. She would, she would just simply, and it was really quite funny, but it was sad. But that's the way she was. You knew if you were okay with her or not because she would ignore you if she didn't like what was going on. I was right there. I was right there in the very room. But she wouldn't acknowledge me. That's kind of the way we do with God sometimes. We know that God is there. There was, there's somebody, you know, as, as in my in my past, I've, I've had an opportunity to visit with a lot of pastors and to share time with them and meet with them. And you might be surprised, but pastors struggle with the same things people struggle with. You know why? Because we're people. And, and, he, and, and, and there was this confession. There was this confession. It was a good thing that he felt comfortable enough to share with me. There, there's this confession. He says, you know, for the, I live sometimes two or three days doing things in the church, preparing lessons, going on visits, but it's almost, I, I don't even pray. I don't acknowledge God. He, he, he made that statement to me. I live as if God doesn't exist. We get so busy sometimes taking God for granted that I suspect some of you are that way, that you might live a whole day or two days or a week without ever acknowledging God's presence. I have been training myself not to do that from the very first waking moment. I want to acknowledge God. I, I, I want to speak to him in some way. And I do it out loud. And, and when I get in the car, that's what I'll do. Jump in, Jesus. We're going on a ride. Need you on the highway because there's some crazies out there. And, and you know, it's just, it's just I talk as if he's in the car sometimes. That's practicing the presence of God. You know, some of the people at the traffic stops and others probably think you're a little bit crazy. Nowadays, they just think you're talking on the phone. So it's better. It's better than it was. But get in the habit of acknowledging him. This is, this is one of the reasons why I've been such a fan of our doing life together. Because what it is, is it forces us to take time every day to open up God's word to get into God's word and to hear his voice. That's what we're doing as we're reading the Bible. We're not just reading words. We're allowing God to speak to us. And what I've learned about that is the more I sense God speaking to me, the more I speak to him. It's only polite. If somebody talks to you, you should respond. And, and she's mad. So, uh, I want to talk to you about this idea. Again, I want to flesh it out. It had a big, long introduction, and today I only have two points. So I've shaved off one. But here we go. There's a story that we ran across this past week about Moses. And, oh, it's been rich this past week, hasn't it? You know, the whole giving of the law. We talked a little bit about that last time and about, uh, you know, the Ten Commandments. And then it took them only 60 days before they're out there making a golden calf and doing all that stuff. Well, there's, there's something that, that only lives in a few verses, but I, it, it's powerful, and I want to share it with you because I think it has to do with this idea of living in the presence of God. This is a time that Moses spent with God that I want to focus on. That Moses had an incredible privilege, like many of the other Israelites that did not get, but the privilege that all of us get because of what Jesus has done. So I want to take a quick look at the story. It's in Exodus chapter 34. I'm going to read, oh, I don't know, four, five, six, seven verses to you. So if you'd like to follow along in your Bible, Exodus 34, verse 29. I'm reading from the New King James, the one that matches your pew Bible. Exodus 34, verse 29. Now it was so when Moses came down from Mount Sinai, now we've got some parentheses here, and the two tables of testimony were in Moses' hand when he came down from the mountain. That Moses did not know that the skin of his face, what? Shone. 
while he talked with him. Verse 30, So when Aaron and all the children of Israel saw Moses, behold, the skin of his face shone, and they were afraid to come near him. Then Moses called to them, and Aaron and all the rulers of the congregation returned to him, and Moses talked with them. Afterward, all the congregation returned to him, and Moses talked with them. Afterwards, all the children of Israel came near, and he gave them as commandments all that the Lord had spoken with him on Mount Sinai. And when Moses had finished speaking with them, he put a veil on his face. But whenever Moses went in before the Lord to speak with him, he would take the veil off until he came out, and he would come out and speak to the children of Israel whatever had been commanded. And whenever the children of Israel saw the face of Moses, that the skin of Moses' face shone, then Moses would put a veil on his face again until he went in to speak with him, thinking of God. All right, two important observations I want to share with you. And again, this is this idea about living in the presence of God. How many of you want to do that? Not just visit God. Don't just visit him, but live in his presence day by day. All right, a couple things that we need to notice here. Here's number one. It's transformative, and other people are going to notice before you. Other people will notice the change that takes place before you. Look at verse 29 again. That's exactly what happened. As Moses goes up and spends time in the presence of God, something happens to him that he is not even aware of, but immediately when he's around other people, look what it says. And now it was so, when Moses came down from Mount Sinai, that Moses did not know the skin of his face shone while he talked with them. Not long ago, I was doing one of my least favorite things to do, wait. Wait. In fact, that's maybe one of the reasons I don't like to go to the doctor's office. I, in fact, if it, you, you know, I'd love to see a doctor's office that advertised no waiting rooms. You walk in and we'll see you. You know, just like that. But they got a special whole little room that you wait in. And so you go in and you wait. And then you finally, you know, ultimately they call you back to another little room and you wait some more. You know, you wonder, is the, is the doctor even in this building? Is he home? Is he playing golf or whatever else? So anyway, I was out in the waiting room trying to practice patience. And I, and I noticed there was another guy that came in and sat down. And, and it was kind of crowded, so he sat close to me. And almost immediately, I sent something about this guy. He was a believer. I just, I just sensed it. And we kind of struck up a conversation, and I shared with him that I was a pastor of a church here in Ellicott City. And, it, and he talked to me, he asked me a couple questions. And then I said, well, what about you? And he goes, no, I'm not a pastor. But he says, I'm very involved as a lay minister in my church. And he was talking about the ways in which he had, had, he had been serving and how God had been blessing. It was a wonderful conversation there that we, uh, we were talking about how God was working in his life and his ministry. And he, he held a full-time job, but he really saw how God was working in his life and he felt the, the nearness and the closeness of God, not only in his ministry, but in his life. When it was all over, I, before, I had, before we were separated, I had to say to him, he, I, I said, you know what? I just knew you were a believer. And it wasn't by his t-shirt, and it wasn't by a big Bible he was carrying around. There was just something about, I won't say his face, but you know what I'm talking about, his presence. You know, there's something about that. There are probably people that you know that when you are around them, you just sense that they have been with God. There's something about it. I want that, don't you? Oh, I want that. I, mean, I, I, I often think about it being like this, the fragrance of Jesus. Sometimes when I'm around my wife and, and you know, I'm hugging on her and, and something like that, and then I leave, her fragrance stays with me. Her fragrance. And I think that's true with Jesus. There's, there's something about when we spend time with him Ian, when we're around other people, they, they, they sense it. And that's what happened with Moses. There was something about Moses that the others 
realize. Moses didn't even realize it. And so I, I want you to know that as you practice this presence and God is changing you, you're not going to be the first one. You're not going to walk into church one day and go, you know what, I think I'm getting holier. Yeah. Well, maybe you would. Have you noticed how holy I've been these days, you say to your wife? No, probably isn't going to happen that way. But you know what others will say? They'll talk behind your back. Wow, have you noticed? Bill doesn't have an anger problem the way he used to. Your family will start talking about you. You know what? Seems like he's more kind. She's more loving. She's more considerate. You know that short fuse? What happened? There's something going on with her. They'll, they'll, they'll think all kinds of stuff. And then when they finally get to ask, you get to share what that is. But that's what, that's what happens. Being in the presence of God changes you to the extent that other people are going to notice. Other people are going to notice. Some of us need to spend time with God because the people around us and the people we live with deserve that. They deserve to live with a better us. Here's the second thing. The presence of God requires total transparency. Now we're going to get a little, get a little touchy here. But here, Exodus 34, verse 34, look at what it says. It's an amazing thing. But whenever Moses went in before the Lord to speak to him, he would do what? He would take the veil off until he came out. When he was around the people... Moses would put on a veil, a covering. But it's interesting, when he goes back before the presence of, the God, of his God, the veil has to come off. Why was Moses' time alone with God so transformative? I believe it was because Moses took the veil off. I mean, I think there's some symbolism here. But in case you don't get it, here's what it is. As human beings, we like to hide. As, as Christians, we like to put on veils. We like to, to put on coverings. We kind of hide the real us. You know, we're hurting and we're struggling and we don't like people to know that, so we, you know, we, we hide behind things. That's, that's just hu the human nature. I hope there are people around you that you can eliminate that, but in public and even in church, that's the way we are. It, it's been that way from the very beginning. Go back to the book of Genesis. Genesis chapter 3, when Adam and Eve sinned. You know one of the first things they did? They started a sewing ministry. Yeah. You know, sin opened their eyes and they said, Nuh-uh, you're not going to see the real me. That's the way we are. Very few people are willing to let you see all of them. And I'm not talking a physical sin. I'm talk, you know what I'm talking about. I've seen people that are married living 30 years, living in the same house, and they're hiding behind fig leaves. They're hiding behind veils. It's like, I can't be me. And so they put up this facade. They do that. And, and, and I guess that is human nature. But when we re interact with one another, we hide a part of ourselves. And that's what Adam and Eve did. They sewed those fig leaves. It was almost like... Look, look at this, but don't look at me. Don't see the real me. You cannot do that with God. God isn't going to play those games. I, I believe that. The veils have to come off. The mask has to come off. The fig leaf has to come off. God wants to be in your presence with you without anything else. Let me make a confession. There are times when I pray and I tell God how thankful I am that everything's going great in my life. That I'm excited about ministry, that I'm excited about my family, that I am feeling great, that I am optimistic to the future, and all of that. And, it's, and, and, I, and I wonder if sometimes God isn't saying, now look, McClendon, calls me by my last name when I, when I talk that way. Or, or, or maybe, look, William, that's what my mother did. I know you're not excited. I know you're not feeling good. I know you're not optimistic. I know what you're feeling. Why do you come here praying lies? 
not being real with me. Why do you put up this mask? You know, the, the, you know at some point, when you, when you practice the presence of God, you realize that's foolishness. God knows you through and through. Don't pretend with him. Don't, don't, you know, don't act. You know, it's almost like God is saying, why don't you just be honest for a change? You know who my hero is? One of my heroes? Job. Job had everything. He had it all. And he lost it all. He lost everything. And what's worse, he didn't understand why he lost it all. You know, he was part of God's bigger plan. That's, that's just sometimes, that's the way it is. God doesn't always reveal everything about it, but God has a purpose. God had a purpose for Job. Job could have claimed the promise if he knew about Romans 8, 28. All things work together for good. We know that now. But talking to Job, who loses his children, that loses his possession, that loses his, his, uh, his uh, health, that, that, you know, lost everything, Job didn't know what was going on. Why is Job one of my heroes? Because he didn't put up a mask. You know, when he talks with God, he talks straight. Three verses, very quickly. Job chapter 10 and verse 7. Although you know I am not wicked, and there is no one who can deliver from your hand, you sense Job's frustration? Chapter 16, verse 7. But now he has worn me out. He's talking to his God. God, you've worn me out. You've made my life desolate. That's what he's talking about. Everything has been taken away. All my company, he's talking about his family, his friends, everything. He stripped it away. Chapter 17, verse 1, he says, my spirit is broken. Not exactly a King James Sabbath school picnic prayer. You know what I'm talking about. That's not what's going on here. He talks to God like he really means it. Why? Because Job knew the truth. That God's presence in our life, moment by moment, minute by minute, means he knows the truth. And there's something powerful and liberating about knowing and acknowledging that. So this week, I want to invite you to begin to grow in this spiritual discipline. Grow in this idea of living in the presence of God. God is there. Stop ignoring him. Stop ignoring. Start acknowledging his presence in your life. It will change you. It's not going to change him because God is unchanging, but it will begin to change you. It'll change you through and through. Stop pretending to be things you're not. Allow God to come in, live his life daily, moment by moment, and I know, I know it'll be a great blessing to you. So I want to invite our worship team we're going to sing the song, Draw Me Close. Let me know you are near. God is, God is near in your life. I want to invite you to begin to live in a way, in a pattern, in a habit that acknowledges that. And I promise you by next Sabbath, things will begin to change. Actually, by tomorrow, things will begin to change. So would you stand with me as we sing the song?